Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where and not only show you answers, but how I got to those answers. Do a little discovery, do a little learning along the way so that you can take those back to your job and be a more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer. My specialty is around the platforms, specifically custom applications and integrations. So if you're looking for help on security or GRC or ITOM, well, we may get into that if it's sort of platform related, but uh, look for other information on the community. There are a wonderful uh, list of experts in all of those groups. We do this every weekday, Monday through Friday on YouTube. You can get the URL there. I encourage you to subscribe. And if you find something helpful in the next hour or so, be sure to like that video and tell others how helpful it was. Also simulcast this on Twitch. So if you happen to be watching there, thank you very much for that. The um, Give me a shout out in the chat room if you happen to be there on YouTube. Just give me a hi, where you're from. Nice to see you there. I'll give you a shout out right back. If you've got a question that goes deeper than that, be sure to go to community.servicenow.com and post your question, issue, whatever it is there. Better system of record than YouTube. YouTube is great for watching on demand, but it's not a good reference when you go back and say, hey, I got a question about Glide Aggregate. Mm. YouTube might have it if it's in the description somewhere, and I will try to note our topics of the day, but I'm not going to have them down to the minute of what I talked about and when. That'd be a lot. Good morning, Robert. Good to see you there. Glad you could join us. Happy Friday to you. Continuing on, if you are new to the community, just a couple of, let's see if we can get that going. There we are. A couple of quick guidelines to help you out. One topic per post, be sure to provide context, all that kind of good stuff. I won't dwell on that too much. If you're an expert and you've been around for a while, consider turning some of that content into more content. <laughs> Blog posts are always appreciated. If you need access, please let me know, and I can certainly steer you in the right direction to the people who can help you with that. Getting onto the developer site is easy. Go to developer.servicenow.com. Get yourself a free personal developer instance, try out London, see what's happening, test out some plugins, see if they're right for you, test the upgrade process, maybe move a few of your update sets over to your personal developer instance and go from Kingston to London. Take a Kingston instance or Jakarta. In no, I don't think we have Jakarta anymore. I don't even think we have this. What do we have? Yeah, Jakarta, is Jakarta, Kingston, and London. I think Istanbul is now off the... Uh, it's too early. I'm forgetting my ABCs. I-J-K-L. Yes, that's right. Istanbul isn't available, but if you're on Jakarta and you want to go to London, you can do that on your personal developer instance. Load up all your update sets, upgrade to London, see what happens. How does it work? What got upgraded? What got skipped? Good beta test there before you start doing this in your enterprise. You can also find the scripting APIs and a lot of information about meetups, which also happen to be over here at meetup.com. Dot com. I went to the Phoenix Developer Meetup last night. A lot of great people. Had a great discussion. We talked about integrations. We talked about um, wherever the conversation really led us and, and what we want to talk about in the future meetings. Uh, looks like I will be at the Melbourne Meetup October 12th. So making my way over there. We're, we've got, we're confirming that. Munich on the 19th and... Maybe one or two more around now forum Sydney and now forum London time frame in mid October. So if you're in one of those areas, I look forward to seeing you. There are also a lot of developer days. Uh, if you are interested in that, if you're a, a an enterprise architect, if you're an admin who wants to be a developer, if you are a uh, check the events list over here at events.html off of our main site, and you can find out more about that. Look for developer days. Look for now summit. Look there's great content all the time and I am posting things on LinkedIn. I think I've, I've posted probably 20 in the last couple of days, 20 different articles to LinkedIn. So go ahead and follow me there if you're not already doing that. Keep up to date on that information. So many great events coming up. I am going to update this on a regular basis. So you know what? I just 
never mind. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of projects that I don't need right now. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you're just joining, we are getting started with the community live stream. That takes us to just about the end. I want to remind you that there is another Tech Now series. This is one of the other major events that I do. It's a webinar put on monthly for administrators and developers about all aspects of the Now platform. So last month, in, well, this month, still August, right? In August, we covered the London Now platform features. And in August, we're going to be talking about extending Integration Hub by making your own spokes. I'm looking forward to this because, like I said yesterday, a lot of the integrations that I do are, I wouldn't call them hard-coded, but they're scripted. I have to write the script and that I, I, I try to encapsulate those into a script and clue that I can use, but the APIs that I'm writing in terms of what I'm passing when I get back uh, feel very developer-ish. And if I could get those into Integration Hub, then we can work with Flow Designer and allow other people to use those. And it would make them easier to share, too. You know, I could publish a spoke and say, here, you want the Todoist integration? This is what you provide. Here's, here's the way to go. Or if you want to take them and extend them. A lot easier for no-coders to say, yes, let's make a Todoist task. Let's sync a Todoist task. Let's use this. Let's do that. I want to see if we can get those into, you know, just take some of the cases that I've built over the years and turn them into Integration Hub spoke. So I'm very much looking forward to this. If you're not familiar with the TechNow series, go to the bit.ly link on the bottom there, servicenow-technow, and you can get to an episode list of all of the TechNow series. We've been doing this for over five and a half years, coming up on six years, about 60 episodes in there. Well, this is number 56 plus a few special ones for uh, CreatorCon that we've done in the last few years. So look forward to that, and I look forward to seeing you there. Any code that I write, any scripts, will be shared in a GitHub repository. I will also post that link in the uh, comments section of this YouTube video. So look in the description if you're watching this after it's been live. If you're watching this live, thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in, and I will get that uh, code to you sometimes in the show. So if you, if you note that link now, you can get there. It's one of my personal repos off of GitHub, but I share it publicly and freely for you. All code is provided as is, no warranty accepted or offered, no, no warranty offered. We'll just put in some minor disclaimers to say, hey, it's offered as part of the community. It's just to save you the time of squinting at the screen and saying, is that a curly brace or a parenthesis? I can't tell. You can copy and paste whatever I type on the screen. I will put into an editor, save it off to GitHub, and away you go. So I provide that free of charge, just like this video. Good morning, Carolyn. Got my retro service now mug. <laughs> I'm a right-handed drinker, so you're not going to see the label too much. And I think I've got some kind of mint tea. Haven't had mint in a while. Must mean that uh, summer is almost over. We're going into the fall season as I uh, get some of that good stuff going. All right, on with the community. Let's dig in. This is the community. Again, real quick, community.servicenow.com. If you want to play along at home, appreciate everybody watching today <clears throat> and those who are watching on YouTube as it's recorded later. I've got a keyboard that's sliding around on me. I need to find some way to anchor that on top of the mixer faders. But for now, that'll do. Do a quick page refresh, because I'm sure lots has happened since we started. Carolyn says, watching an old Tech Now episode yesterday helped me fix an unrelated problem on my PDI since I saw the field I needed. Awesome. I'm glad those things are still working. I, I, I go back every once in a while and I look and say, is this uh, still useful, useful information? ServiceNow generally doesn't take anything out of the platform. That would be a problem to customers who have adopted that technology. This question comes up all the time around things like Flow Designer. Hey, is Flow Designer replacing Workflow? Is Workflow going away? What's happening to the Graphical Workflow Engine? Graphical Workflow Engine is staying where it is. It will be there for the indefinite future. We can't rip that out because a lot of people have built their processes over the last 10 years. I remember when Workflow was brand new in 2008. I'd just gone to system administrator training, and I think they came out with it a few months before that, summer of 2008. So it's been about 10 years. They said, this is the newest, greatest, coolest thing. Prior to workflows, you had to do execution plans. Execution plans are still there. In fact, they're making a comeback in, um, oh, no, I can't remember. It was uh, 
the, the, they had made a, uh, a comeback in ServiceNow Express for, for the no-code stuff, but uh, they are still there. Was it? No, I can't remember. Execution plans or delivery plans? I can't remember. But that stuff is still there. There's a lot of uh, there's there's some technology that we may come out with a version two or version three of this thing and deprecate the old one, but it doesn't mean that you can't still use the older technology. So workflows will always be there. And uh, I guess where was I going with this? Tech now. See if tech now is the information is still valid. And and, and I don't want to leave something out there. Yes, there are videos about what's new in Eureka. Well. There are some notification features that came out in Eureka, for example, or the script REST APIs or the table REST APIs in Fuji that are still valid today. So even though it was three, four years ago that some of these came out, it's still valid. Uh, what are some of the other ones? Script include the best practices that we have. They're still there. If something is no longer valid, I'll add it to the comments on the YouTube video. But I don't think we're going to reshoot any of that stuff. I'm definitely not doing the jelly videos again. <laughs> that's, that's, again, another case of we're not doing any further development on it. You can still use jelly, recognize it doesn't work in Service Portal, but you could still use it and the, the videos are still valid. So good morning, Akash. Good to see you. Good morning, Cooking Fever. Very good day to everybody. Happy Friday. TGIF. Put that on your tennis shoes. Put it on any shoes. You know what TGIF stands for if you put it on your shoes? Toes go in first. All right, where's my... <laughs> I had a rim shot on here, but I had to rebuild the soundboard, so now I don't know where it went. So my... I'll have to find that again. Note to self. Add rim shot back to the uh, soundboard. Still haven't done anything on the community, and it is now 12 minutes past the hour. Let's get started. Let's dig in with some unreplied things. I already took care of the inbox this morning, so we don't see it. Help with inbound action. That might involve scripting. Let's take a look at that. I've changed my methodology up a little bit. I used to open up a bunch of new tabs and then just crank through them, but I found by the time I answered two or three of them, numbers three, four, and five were already responded to or had an answer, so I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to take them one at a time and refresh frequently. Save early, save often. I have been asked to create an inbound email action to take emails from a customer and add it to an existing ServiceNow ticket. I have read around the docs, but I'm still a bit confused and was wondering if someone can clarify. When I get a reply from a customer using the update incident inbound action out of the box, it creates a new ticket. Does the customer have to put RE incident number to get the target to that particular incident? If you don't have a watermark, okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to go by the three rules here. So there's, there's three basic things. There are three ways that ServiceNow attaches an email response, an in an email response to a record in the database. Database or number one. I think we're all familiar with this one. Watermarks. You will see a ref colon MSG blah 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 at the bottom of the message. This is tracked in the sys underscore watermark table. If your message doesn't have that, come on. Then number two is subject line. The system will try to parse the record display value e.g. incident, one, two, three, one, two, whatever it is, from the subject and match that to a known record. Number four is an email header, and I can't remember. It's like X underscore something. I don't recall. I wonder if I can find it real quick in Evernote. Hold on. Maybe, maybe, watermark. 
It's amazing what you get when you type a watermark in Evernote. Video ideas, service now trivia questions. Hey, my trivia questions. I found them. <laughs> I thought I lost those. Watermark creativity, Helsinki day one, TOI, scope apps, TVB, email scripting. Hmm. Watermark table. Helsinki was maybe it was on Helsinki TOI. Mm, no more cascade deletes this watermark. What is this one? Pardon me. I'm just looking through my endless of watermark collisions between partners. Nope. Maybe it was Jakarta. Nope. I can't find it real quick. Random email watermarks. What is the problem? How are we solving? Not seeing it, not seeing it, not seeing it. Table changes, fixes to a plug-in, base watermark, 31 characters. Watermark password. Oh, those are the properties we added in. Now, okay. Boring video. Don't watch Chuck Mumble to his Evernote. Email header. There is an X dash something header that it uses as a last request, last attempt. This isn't supplied often. I don't remember the details on this, so. If you have none of these, then it cannot match a record and thus creates a new one. All right. More information available at Watermarks. So David asks a question, is the received email being classified as a reply or is it being processed in inbound action? Have a look at the email in the email logs and check what actions have been processed on it. That's a good idea. So incoming email is processed by SysWatermark. SysWatermark. Uh, by the inbound actions and all actions that it attempts, attempt, all inbound actions that are attempted are logged against that. Sorry, minor distraction is the garbage truck and recycle truck go by. The Dawn Chorus, as I call it. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, unreplied messages. Thank you for watching. If you're just joining us, this is the ServiceNow community live stream where I go through and attempt to help people with platform, custom application, and integration questions in the community. And you get the insight as to where that information came from, how it's discovered, what's the what's the process, so you can take that back home and use it for yourself. Somebody asked me, hey, is there a uh, an ITOM version of this video? Sadly, no. I don't even know if any other vendors are doing anything like this. This is just a random harebrained idea that I had last November and said, you know what, I'm in the community a couple hours a day, why don't I just turn on the camera and work with you and have this interactive time that we can go through this. Carol says it's not Friday without that noise. I'm curious, what day is garbage day in your neighborhood? <laughs> at least they're not coming around at 4 a.m. Some places do that. We'd like to understand the code behind the stakeholders task which created when new demand is created. I'm not, demand generation is part of ITVM. This should really have gone in, in uh, Next meeting, ServiceNow User Group Minnesota. I know when the next developer meetup is, but I don't know when the next ServiceNow User Group. There are forums in here for uh, SNUGs, for ServiceNow User Groups, if you're interested in joining that. Now, ServiceNow User Groups differ from developer user groups. ServiceNow User Groups are more broad in topic. You might be looking at somebody's, a customer says, hey, I'd like to go through my change management process, which is very interesting. You get to see how they implement it, they get to learn. You might hear about some customer's journey from when they started looking at different platform tools, why they select, you know, very broad in, in that kind of thing. Developer meetups are going to be more technically focused for the developers, for the administrators, so that they can brush up their skills and provide solutions quicker. So it's not so much about the products and the features and the, you know, it, it, rarely does ServiceNow prevent, pre present on a ServiceNow topic. I do it occasionally around this time when we have a new release, a developer meetup will say, hey, can you come to Sacramento and talk about all the London features? Sure, be happy to do that. If you didn't see TechNow episode 55. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> that's that's another option. You can just watch the video and you get basically the same information because it's the same deck. <clears throat> what do we have? Change condition for cab workbench. Exporting report to PDF. Oh, here's something that came up last night. Uh, glide sys attachment. This was an interesting discussion we had. Very conceptual. So glide sys attachment is our API to manage attachments. Let me log back into the developer portal. Developer.servicenow.com, all the scripting APIs. And glide sys attachment is very, uh, very useful for... My video looks a little washed out. I'm going to have to play with the lighting again. Page not found. Uh, the heck you say. Glide sys attachment. Let's go to API server. Search. Glide sys attachment. That's our API for managing attachments. And it has several, uh, several methods in it. One of them is very common, which is glide sys attachment copy. And people use this to copy a file between in a file attachment between one record and another. Hey, I've got an attachment on an incident. I need to propagate that to the parent problem or the linked problem. Let me use GlideSys attachment copy to indicate the source table, the target table, the source sys ID, and the target sys ID, and it will make a copy of that attachment. I've seen that happen a lot in the community. There's also the ability to delete an attachment. You can get content up to five megabytes, return in a string. So there's the, the five megabytes thing. And one girl said, hey, is there a way in ServiceNow that we can present somebody with a PDF of you know, a certificate of completion when they complete something went, and, and, and have it as an attachment? Because I showed her a way to create content using the write method. And write method takes a glide record. In my business rule, I just said current, or UI action, excuse me. It was a UI, it was a UI action. I gave the file a name. Mine was just called questions.html. The content type was text slash HTML. I don't know if there's an example here or not. No, there isn't. And then dumped out all the string. And she said, when she saw me write a file and it ended up as an attachment. So I was taking records from ServiceNow, generating the HTML, and attaching it to the parent record. She went, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know you could make attachments. Yes, you can make attachments without using the paperclip icon. Very handy. And she wants to take a, a make a PDF. PDF generators are a little more complex. But what we thought was... What if you made a template PDF? Because effectively, template or excuse me, PDFs are text. There, there are some binary objects in there, but by and large, you don't need to worry about those too much. What we thought was create a template, and instead of putting, you know, this hereby certifies that Chuck Tomasi has completed all the requirements for something, 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 and you get the signature and you get the date, whatever. Put in a string that you can easily search and replace, like underscore, underscore, f username, underscore, underscore, or whatever you choose. Some meta string, asterisk, 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 username. Put something like that in and then do the glide sys attachment, get content, bring that all in, and you look, it returns a string. You could use just a regular JavaScript replace on that. This is still all conceptual. <clears throat> so get the content from a template record. You know where that is. Okay, you're going to have uh, the 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 sys attachment record sys ID. Maybe you store that in a system property. Where to find that attachment? Doesn't matter to me. Somewhere in the system, you've got a default PDF. Bring that in. Do a search and replace. Write it back out to the new record. It's a thought. It probably would, wouldn't take too long to, to test this out. You'd have to generate a PDF with that template information in it, but could be done. Could be done. So that's the kind of fun we have at the developer meetups is talking, discussing, discovering, architecting, and I'll bet somebody in that developer meetup is going to play around with this today and go, hey, Chuck, I got it. Take a look at this.
Um, that's another good thing that personal developer instances are good for. I have half a mind to try that right now. But I'd like to get a little more community education in here. Maybe I'll play with that uh, tomorrow morning when I'm up at 5 a.m. Because I get up at 5 a.m. anyway. It makes getting up on Monday a lot easier if you just stick with the schedule. Where were we? Let's refresh this. I've been, I've been yakking for a while. Reload. Thought I could hit the icon and it would reload. It did not. Unreplied. My workflow stage in progress even after the activity got completed. Are you advancing the workflow stage in the workflow? Pictures are worth a thousand words in here. Service not data scientist, sorting a result based on assignment group count. Would like to understand the code behind stakeholder tasks, which created, we got that. That's down on demand generation. Let's see. My workflow stage is in progress even after, my workflow stage is in progress even after the activity got completed. In the below image, RSF and BVP review is completed, but it still shows in progress. Okay. You will need to take a look at the workflow and identify the path that your flow took through the activities and ensure that the activities are managing the stage properly. Stage is set, is controlled by the stage field on the workflow activities. Come on, fingers, work today. Think we can get a picture real quick? Let's go to the workflow editor. Show you where this is, not just making this up. Workflow, workflow, workflow. Nice and quick today. All right, let's take something like a request item. Item designer. Let's see, service catalog request. Pretty sure that has some stages in it along the way. Set value, set requested, if price, blah, blah, blah. Let's take one of these. I think I need to check it out. But existing, maybe it's already checked out. Maybe I'm not in the right scope. I'm not. Curses. These are in global. Let's try that again. Workflow, workflow editor. Request, not source request, service catalog request. There it is. Now I should see checkout. If you don't see checkout, make sure you're in the right scope. Many of the out-of-the-box ones are global. Let's go to approval group, double-click that, and there's the stage field. So make sure, let's take a screenshot of that. And paste it in there. Always helpful. I haven't been ringing the bell. Must ring the bell. Morning, Mark. Mark just says Monday. <laughs> Kosh got me. <laughs> I should have looked up there before. You and I thought it at the same time. Where's the bell? Where's the bell? The bell is there. For that, I should probably get one of these. Right. Or maybe this. <laughs> Kevin's doing fine. <laughs> Mark Pro Stage, join us at the DC Metro Service Now user group. User group coming up, snug coming up in the DC area on 9 11. Help with inbound email action. We got four replies, which means there's one in the mailbox. Let's go look in the mailbox. 
I have some, <laughs> I have some a mailbox tune that I play on our podcast. It's a bit long. I don't think I want to use it here. All right, why not? This is what we do when we get email. <laughs> All right, you get the idea. Stop that. All right, Brad Tilton comes back and says, Hi, Matt, this functionality should be working by default. Here's the documentation that should help. It talks about watermarks, inbound email action, matching criteria. Hey, let's take a look at that because I want to know if that header is in there. Somewhere in here, wow, that's a bit small on the font. From replies, new actions, skip reply, run reply, record table matches inbound actions table, reply to header contains matching record number. Uh, there's another one in there that's not defined. Run inbound action, custom matching criteria, inbound action criteria, forward, reply. Where's the watermark? In reply to email. That might be what, when no watermark is present. That might be what I was thinking of. I thought, I thought email headers started with an X if they were self-defined. Pardon me, I don't remember my RFC 822 all that well. I remember the number better than I remember the spec. That's how you know when somebody's dealt with... I've dealt with email headers in the past. You remember crazy RFC numbers. Okay, ServiceNow data scientists in the data is ServiceNow jobs. There is a jobs form in here. If you're interested, check that out. There's also one in the Slack group. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but sndevs.slack.com. S-N-D-E-V-S, and I believe I signed into this one with my Gmail account, but I could be wrong. I don't even know if that's the right password. Yes? No? Fail on all levels. I'm going to have to go look in my password vault for that one. But sndevs.slack.com, uh, there is a job community in there as well. So check it out if you're interested. There's always opportunities. It amazes me how many come up. And you can also look around LinkedIn. There's people that ping on a daily basis, it seems like. Uh, let's see. Nothing else new in here. You know what else? Uh, I haven't looked too far down here. Has breached Task LA. People must be picking these up pretty quick. How to drag and drop upstream and downstream profile using dependency map. That's for GRC. Configuring a report to get a trend. Visual task board owner is not able to create tasks. Uh, just because you're a VTP owner doesn't mean you necessarily can create tasks. You need ACLs to be able to create tasks. I am the owner of a VTB, but when I click the plus button and create a task field, they're coming. Read only, not able to, I'd say, check your, check the permissions, uh, check the ACLs. Check the ACLs on that particular table where you are trying to create a task. It is likely you don't have create access. Mm, security? I'm trying to remember my macro. Yay! Okay, good. There we are. Let's keep going. What else do we have in here? Close change has caused incidents, hiding CI relationship. Got something in the inbox again. Refresh that. Or was that just an old page? Yeah, it was an old page. See, this thing, I, this needs to be more dynamic across tabs. That's what I say. Hiding CI relationship, unable to activate ITSM virtual agent conversation on dev 64900 from Anders Johansson. Do we have the ability to do that plugin? Virtual agent conversation. Let's take a look. 
plugins. London has virtual agent, and I believe you have access to this on your personal developer instances. So virtual agent service portal widgets, virtual agent web client. Let's he gave us the ID. The ID was com.snc.itsm virtual agent. So let's go to here. And the ID is com.snc.itsm.virtualagent. I don't see it. All righty. Is there anything else? So virtual agent is not currently available, or is it just that's not how you do it? Let's take a look at developer.servicenow.com. Go to Manage Instance and see if it's available in the plugins. I don't know, what, why is my Manage Instance page not working? There it goes. And under here, I can say Activate a Plugin. Let's see if Virtual Agent is in fact listed on my plan, 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 queen. If it's listed on the list it's not. Ooh, wait, there's more. The font is too large. Survey, survey, survey. I'm not seeing virtual agent in here anywhere. Ah, customer service virtual agent conversations. Intriguing. Glide virtual agent activates the virtual agent framework as other and other necessary plugins. We could try that. Human resources. ITSM virtual agent conversations. Okay, so the answer to this is, we all know the answer to this now. Let's see how they're activating it. I get an error message when trying to activate ITSM virtual conversation 64. Can you assist in the activation? Are you trying to activate this through the developer portal? Developer.service now. You know what? Let's just put a link in there instead of being 1990s. Command K, HTTPS, developer.servicenow.com. I almost put a dash in there. Wow, that was retro. Okay. Using manage instance, then pick here. I'm going to be nice instead of just making that statement. Just checking. Then the menu to activate a plugin. Have you activated the... It should do this by default. I'm not certain how it works with the with with the uh, personal developer instance, but it should activate plugin uh, dependencies first. So maybe Glide Virtual Agent. I don't know which ones these are hooked up to. There's CSM, Glide Virtual Agent, HR, ITSM, and no, that's virtual virtualization. Okay. Try doing Glide first. Maybe. Activates the virtual agent framework and the other necessary plugins. That's my suggestion. Glide virtual agent first. That looks like the base VA framework. I'd try that first and then the ITSM stuff second. There we are. Ding. There we are. Thank you. <laughs> so where does this go? Community home. Let's roam through. Do a quick page refresh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's roam through. Nothing in the inbox. See what we've got just from what's been happening recently in conversation. There's mine. Workflow activity error. 
Looks like it was freshly answered. Let's see what the conversation was all about. We can learn from other people's conversations. Hi, I have created an application using Studio and added the table with some fields. I'm now creating a workflow on that. And after dragging in approval user activity and adding approver and submitting the activity, I'm getting an error attached below. On submit script error, reference error, encrypted variable is not defined, G form, get view name, diagrammer, blah, blah, blah. The solution, when was this posted? Two hours ago. I have searched for encrypted variable in client script and disabled the submit encrypted input on submit client script and tried to submit my activity. Now it's working. Ooh, yeah, be careful with that one. Be careful with that one. Disabling an out-of-the-box client script could have ramifications elsewhere. Be sure you test. Okay, I'm glad this solved your issue. I recommend doing a lot of testing if you disabled an out-of-box ServiceNow client script. This could be required elsewhere. I would hate to think fixing one thing caused a cascade of other issues. Test, 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 test. <laughs> and a smiley face for you. There. Now I'm getting into it. Is there a way to create a filter that includes task that I am assigned to and groups that I am in? Yes. Okay. Is there a way to create a filter that includes tasks that I'm assigned to and groups that I'm in? Currently, I have all assigned to me task type, not an equal request, state in new and active, waiting or required equals true. Is it possible to do task assigned to me or assignment group contains my sys ID? Well, your sys ID is not going to be in the assignment group. Let's see what people come up with. Yes, you could do something that that will give you is dynamic or assignment group dynamic. This is the same thing. 2F2B477FE. Oh, different group. Assignment group is dynamic, one of my groups. Way to go, Mike. Is this the author who responded back? No. E Shalom. I'm making that up. I don't know how you pronounce that. Your application navigator is a filter. This one does. Assignment group is dynamic, one of my groups. Okay. Although these look like ands. This one looks like an or. So this one is an or. This one is an and. Note the slight difference. Pardon the scrolling. I can tell from the encoded query that it says up caret or, but it also says or down here in the image. Assigned to is dynamic me or assignment group is dynamic one of my groups. This one does not have the or. They're stacked vertically, so that's an and. So a little bit. Uh, and another way you can create a reference field, which referred to table that you want, incident task sys user. And this condition is a simple reference qualifier. Da, 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 da. Okay, that one's under control. So if you're not familiar with this, very easy to do. Let's go to task.list. I'm going to build this one for you. Assign to is dynamic. This means it go, we will go and look at what dynamic filters are available on. Okay, you could say one of my assignments, one of my approvals, users of roles. It's looking at, because this is a reference to sys user, it's looking at any dynamic references for task and sys user. And I could say me or assignment group. Now we're pointing to a different table, group. And in this case, oop, I don't want to look that up. Is dynamic. One of my groups is the only thing I can choose. So dynamic filters. They came, a, came out a while ago. And if I look for the one that says me, current name, me, here it is. They're just a little script. So the script is very simple. When I do is dynamic, it says I need a reference to sys user. So any field that is referencing sys user, I can apply this to. 
It's available for default. It's available for reference qualifiers. I could use it as an advanced, uh, as, as a uh, dynamic reference qualifier. I talked to, did I talk about those yesterday? No, I was making a PowerPoint with dynamic reference qualifiers. So I'll get back to that in a second. Or you can use it as a filter. Let's see if we have hover over on here. Dynamic option can be selected as an operand in a filter. Dynamic option can be selected as a default value in a dictionary entry. Interesting that it, this isn't selectable as a filter, but it, it's available as a filter. Somehow I'm able to use me in this filter. Let's see, is there another one? Let's do a show matching. Maybe we have two. We do have two. Okay, one is available for filter true. One is available for default. Why, are, why do we have two? Why don't we just check the box? That's wacky. Let's see if we can find out what the difference is. It's learning time, people. Okay, this one says me, gs.getUserID, reference. So in the old days, before we had dynamic filters, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a quick, quick retro tour. This is still possible, and you can, you can do this, is if I have tasks, I can say, Assigned to is, and what we used to do is put JavaScript colon gs.getUserID. This is one of the first things I learned that was kind of technical. Oh, it doesn't let me do that anymore. Run. And it says, assigned to is Chuck Tomasi. Some of these modules, I think, actually have that now, uh, or still have that as a filter. But that's the way we used to do it in the old days. It eventually did put in my name, but you could script a module in here to put in JavaScript colon. And if it got to be a complex expression where you wanted assigned to is someone in my group, okay, you could do that as well and show your group's queue. Maybe assigned to my group would be a better idea, but you get the idea. Uh, so that's the way we used to do it with JavaScript colon. Now it's effectively the same thing is dynamic filter options me. I was comparing these things. I got off track. So GS get user ID pointing a reference sys user. Let's look at the next record. I'll put this away. So I, oh, where's my up and down arrows? Oh, I'm looking at one record. I apologize. I did this wrong. I want Label contains me, and then I did a show matching, and I found both of them. Come on. Wow, my context menu wouldn't stick. What's the difference between that one? Well, one is a semicolon. Ooh, this one doesn't. Anyone else seeing a reason why we need two of these? <coughs> Excuse me. Why do we need two? Why don't we just go like this? Seems crazy. Maybe one develop, these were developed independently. One didn't know what the other was doing. All right, let's take a look at something else where the reference table is sysuser group, or maybe it's sysuser gr member, or maybe it's going by the label. <laughs> Curses. Oh, because I've still got this file, this filter in here. That helps. Okay. One of my groups. Let's take a look at the script in there. This script is calling get my groups. What is get my groups? It's one of two things. It's either a global business rule, curses, no global business rules, don't write them yourself, or it's a function in a script include, which is a better way to do it. So let's go see if we can find out. Where would I find that? Well, I'm going to cheat and use Studio's code search to find that. Pick any old application, I don't care. I'm going to do a code search, search all applications for get my groups. I don't even, it's not case sensitive. And it found it in a script include get template list. It found it in a business rule. Oh, looks like it, this is probably an old legacy one called get my groups and it found in a macro and an ACL. So it's being used in several places. 
this particular script include is calling it. I can tell that from JavaScript colon something or other. You know, you really don't need to, that's not the optimal way to do this. <laughs> They're making an encoded query with JavaScript in it, in JavaScript, okay? My standard method is run the JavaScript first, get rid of this part, and just put in the return value and concatenate that. I don't, I don't know. Maybe this is so you can debug the query more effectively. So groups, banners, what an interesting name. This is a global business rule. It's running on the global table. The reason you don't want to use global business rules is because they are loaded for every page in the system. How many times are you going to need get my groups? Maybe on a list, maybe in a script here or there. Script includes, on the other hand, are only loaded and run on demand. So loading it for every page is a waste of time. It doesn't need to happen. So if you're in a scoped application, you can't even select the global table. If you are writing globally scoped table, if your application here is global, then yes, you can choose it, but I wouldn't. The only thing this does is create some functions. These could easily, if you have written these in the past, don't take the ones that are out of the box and change them, but if you've written globally uh, global business rules, if you have any business rules that you've written on the global table, that their primary responsibility is to define functions like this, recurse parents, get my groups. Look, it just, it just calls this one line of a built-in function. Okay, crazy. Someone wanted an easier way to address it than that. But that being what it is, if you've written stuff like this, it's very easy to take this code and convert it to a script include. What I would do is copy that, create a new business, create a script include. Let's create that in my CLS for whatever reason. I am in my CLS community live stream. Create application, server development, script include. And the name of the function was get my groups. Now, by default, as script includes are want to do, it will fill in some script down here for a prototype style script include, where I would instantiate this with a new keyword, var si equals new script include name. Take that out, paste that in, Disable the global business rule. These are the ones that you've written. I'm not, I'm just doing this as an example. Let's say I wrote this particular business rule. Now I can still call it. I don't have to change anything anywhere else. If it's used in a reference qualifier, if it's used in a workflow script, I don't have to change any of that. I don't even need to know where it's called. I just change the way it's instantiated. So this is a more effective way. This is one of the technical best practices. Avoid using global business rules. Don't create any new ones yourself. You should always be going through the uh, script include way of doing this. Wow, end of the week, voice is getting worn out. Did you just remove the middle part of the breadcrumb filter? How did you do that? I need to do that all the time. Oh, you know what? I apologize, I went by really fast when I did that. Let's go back to the dynamic filters. This is where I was, and yes, if I hover over this, it selects all. So the first one removes everything after the, the, the first greater than sign. If I hover over the greater than sign, remove next condition. See the, see the little pop-up, the tooltip there? And it's got that label contains me grayed out. If I click on that, it removes subsequent conditions, which would be effectively the same as clicking this one because it's a three-part thing. So just slowly hover over this and watch what happens. So the, the label equals me, if I take that out, I click on the first greater than sign, it comes out. <laughs> Good question, Jeff. Don't let me get away with some of these things. If, you see, if anybody sees something that I did too quickly and you went, what did you do? Oh, you know what I haven't tested on this computer yet? Is our double click friend there? No, it's not. 
if, in some cases, if you double click on the breadcrumbs, a pop-up will come up. I think Carolyn, you may have spotted this, or uh, uh, somebody else. Somebody else did uh, a while back. And I know this worked on my iMac. Doesn't work on my MacBook Pro. Doesn't work on my Mac Mini. So check and see if you can double click the breadcrumb. Does a filter come up, or does it just redraw the table? Now, of course, there's always copy query, which copies it to the clipboard, but you don't actually see what it is, unless, of course, you did something like, you know, paste it in there or paste it somewhere where you can actually see it. Oops, that's a table GR member. Copy query. It's copied to the clipboard. And if I go to a text editor, here's one with yesterday's code, I think. Close that up. Is that something we did yesterday? Yes. Table equals sysurgr. That's not the query. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> All right. If I wanted to add additional queries like star me, then my query would have slightly different stuff. Table equals sysurgr member, up caret, label like me. What good is that? Why would you want to copy the query? because you can use that in a glide record method called add encoded query and reproduce the same result in script. Let me show you a case where I do that in incident. I do this when the queries get a little nasty. They start to get too complex. First, build out your query. And there's, I, I've got a, uh, a video on this somewhere on the community. If you look for building complex queries quickly or fast or something like that, Let's start with something simple, like active is true. This may be a review for some of you, maybe something new. So I'll try to make this explainable. So I'm sure everybody's done this before. They've, they've created a filter, very simple, active equals true, run the filter, and you get just your active incidents or any other record based on any other filter. You can copy this query and of course, it's a very, very simple active equals true. Easy to do. Let's make it a little more complex. And maybe it's not even done from the breadcrumbs. I don't like the self-service view. I'm sorry. I just, there's not enough there for me. I just clicked on the wrong module and it defaulted that. Let's take the priority ones. So show matching. And now my breadcrumbs become, I'm going to make that a little larger so you can see it. Active equals true, priority one. If I copy that query, I try doing a five minute or less version of, of encoded queries. Compare that, it now adds up caret priority equals one. That's effectively an and. So show me all the records where active is true and priority is one. And we can continue doing this with maybe filter out Joe employee from this, and it keeps building the breadcrumb, and it keeps building the query, caller ID not equal to blah, 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 or caller ID not equal to null, uh, caller ID null. That's something that we had a discussion on Live Coding Happy Hour. Implicitly, it's putting in null. So for whatever reason, when you do one of these not equals to something, it doesn't f do the nulls. It, it, it needs to, I don't know if that's a MySQL thing that we're just patching around or why that happens. But if you're writing one of these, watch for that. But we're getting a little crazy now. It's no longer just a series of ands. We've got an or in here that, I, oddly enough, doesn't show up. Oh, it does show up down here. Okay. So even though I didn't type that into my filter originally, what if I did that and run that? Did it take that part out of the query? I'll bet it did. Yeah, okay. So let's take this one. What good is that? Well, the, that is, <clears throat> to me, that is good for scripting. Let's, let me just write a script around that real quick. I'll make these comments and I can show you what each one of them does. By doing a glide record query, var Inc. GR equals new glide record incident table done. Then I can do ink 
gr dot add encoded query and put in let's take this one for example var q equals single quote wow that's a long string give me over there turn it into an actual statement q not two q Ink gr.query, pretty standard stuff there. And rather than list them all out, let's just return a count. So ink gr gs.info ink gr.get row count. There we are. Copy, put that into scripts background. One of my favorites. Reduce that so I can actually see the script. And it says Security restricted read table from CLS was granted, da 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 da. I've got 10 records returned. I can verify that by going to this query and saying, yep, it was 10 records. There's the same thing caller not equal Joe employee, priority one active true. So that's an easy way to create these very complex queries for a script. Now, obviously, if I had a user in here and I said, well, I don't want to hard code Joe employee in there. I want to hard code maybe the current user. You could obviously do that with var user ID equals gs.get user ID. And then compose this string. This is what I was talking about earlier is I wouldn't put a JavaScript colon in here. I would just run the JavaScript because what they did in their script is JavaScript colon gs dot get user ID. And I said, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just write your script like that and then put in here plus, close the quote, plus user ID plus another quote. I think that's a lot more readable. Gives you a free variable to debug that you can understand, did this actually work? And this should probably return something like zero. Let's go back to scripts background. It's the top of the hour. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. I got 15 because I filtered out records that weren't there. I'm, I'm saying don't show me things where it's not system administrator. Away you go. All right. Double click to edit encoded query is for some Chrome extension. You know what? I think you're right. I think you're right. Somebody was telling me about that. Let me go to extensions. There is a service now utils. I'm going to turn that on. Maybe you may have just uncovered the mystery because I had this enabled at one point and it might just be this browser. So let's go back to, let's do system logs all. There it is. It's the ServiceNow Utils Chrome extension. If you want to see what that query looks like, you can actually double click it. All right. I forgot all about that Chrome extension. Thank you. Thank you, Aru, Ar, Arnoud. You got it. That was awesome. So take the example I had before where it's not Joe employee. Double click. It's there. This is not installed on my laptop, which is why it didn't work. Mystery solved. I don't need to beat the UI people over the head with it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There's a quick tip. If you found something useful in today's show, make sure to click that like button and uh, other people will find it just as easily. Thank you for watching. That concludes today's episode. I look forward to talking to you all on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. And until then, if you learn something, share it just as I do every day. And you will be helpful to other people. That's the mission of this broadcast. And that is the end of this broadcast. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye.